floor overflow. There's a group of people up there. Welcome to you too. And uh, happy Easter to you all. Uh, David was talking about our children. What a beautiful thing. I just went upstairs to see, because first time we've had overflow on the third floor. We just put that TV up above the pellet stove this week. David did that. And uh, so I went down the hall, and Matthew's already in front of a full class of the older kids. So what a blessing. I got to stop at the door, and, uh, and Matt said, hey, say good morning to, to Pastor Pat. And so it's like, wow, what a beautiful sight. And uh, so I said, hey, did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? The whole class, yes. Did he rise again from the dead? Yes, because he's God. Yes, okay, I'm going to say he is risen, and Matt says, and you guys say back, he's risen indeed. So I said, he is risen, and the class says, he is risen indeed. So, beautiful. I want to say happy anniversary to David, because it was 27 years ago on Easter Sunday in Chino at a park in an Easter service that our whole family first met him for the first time, and he ended up marrying Jenna, as you know. So every Easter, it's happy anniversary. It's the day we met him. What a blessing. So um, we're going to pray, but first of all, I love Phil Wickham, and I've been listening over and over to a couple of his worship albums this week, and they so glorify God. So you might, if you like him too, recognize, I just wrote down just a Man, you know, he just makes your heart worship. He has this song, and part of it he says, the king is in the room. Man, isn't that beautiful? Jesus, the risen Lord. The king is in the room. And then there's another song, and he said, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And both of those are true. Before we pray, whenever we see our Lord Jesus speaking with individuals in the gospel stories, he had a way of going right to the heart of the matter, straight to the heart of the individual he was talking to, when we would see him talking to one person. Well, that's you today, the individual. As the king, our Lord, risen Lord Jesus Christ is in the room. He walks among us here, and here's the question. What does he want to say to you straight to your heart? Because he goes straight to the matter, and that's where he's taking us this morning. So two things I'm thinking, you know, the king, right? Um, Whether you're in here or third floor or first floor, feel welcome to still stay seated, and if it's hard for you to stand up. But two things I think we want to stand in the presence of the king as we pray But as we do, we want to just bow our hearts all the way down inside and worship him. Amen. So if you're able, as we pray, would you just stand in the presence to honor our risen Lord Jesus Christ this morning? Master, Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, risen Savior, our Lord and our God, we stand in honor, in your presence, Lord, as you walk among us. And inside, Lord, we bow our hearts all the way down. And as the women met you returning from the tomb on Easter morning, and you said rejoice, and they held your feet, Lord, we fall down at your feet, Lord, and we worship you. And we love you, and we adore you, and we thank you for this day. And Lord, we're asking that this would be very personal between you and each of us right now in our hearts. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Okay, please take a seat again. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. And then the book of Acts. Let's go to chapter 16, verse 22, if you would, please. So that's Acts 16, 22. And as you're turning there, talk about going right to the heart of the matter. 112 years ago, on the night of April 12, 1912, the Titanic struck an iceberg. 
Pastor John Harper was on board. He was from England. They had just called him to be pastor of Moody Church in Chicago. So on that maiden voyage of the Titanic, he's traveling across the Atlantic Ocean, right, with his six-year-old daughter, and they're headed for New York City. After the ship struck an iceberg and began to sink, he got his daughter, her name was Nana, N-A-N-A, into a lifeboat, but apparently he made no effort to follow her. He got her in the lifeboat, right? Instead, it was just him and his daughter on that trip. Instead, he ran through the ship. And as he ran through the ship, he was yelling. So imagine yelling at the top of your lungs. And here's what he was yelling. Women, children, and unsaved into the lifeboats. Lifeboats. Not just women and children, but women and children and unsaved into the lifeboats. Survivors report that he then began witnessing to anyone who would listen as the ship, right, is sinking. He continued preaching even after he had jumped into the water and was clinging to a piece of the wreckage, and he had already given his life jacket away to someone else, to another man. Four years later, after the ship sunk, his final moments, what I'm sharing with you now, were recounted by another man at a Christian meeting in... Hamilton, Ontario, and he said this. Here are his very words. I am a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone on a spar, that's a piece of timber, that awful night the tide brought Mr. Harper of Glasgow, also on a piece of wreck, near me. Man, he said, are you saved? No, I said, I am not. He replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Stop. There's more to the story, but first a question. Are you saved? That's what he was asked in the water by that pastor. Are you saved? No, you say, I am not, just like that man. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's right to the heart of the matter this morning. That's where the Lord wants to take it. He goes on and he says, the waves bore him away, but strange to say, brought him back a little later. That's the Lord, right? And he said, again, are you saved now? No, I said, I cannot honestly say that I am. He said again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And shortly after he went down and there alone in the night with two miles of water under me, I believed. I am John Harper's last convert. You guys, he was only one of six people that was picked up out of the water by the lifeboats. And the other 1,522, not everyone died, but 1,522 perished or died that night, including John Harper, who had given his life vest and was preaching the gospel. And here we are. 112 years later, and not one person is still alive today who was there that night. They've all passed into eternity. I wonder, did you come over the bridge coming here this morning? Some people came, 197, some people came from Brookings. But it might be safe to say that all of us in this whole building at some time have probably driven over that bridge. And I just share that with you to let us know that Every person in the world today lives by faith every day. Do we? You put your trust in that bridge. Faith is trust, right? When you take an airplane flight, do you insist on meeting the captain, checking his credentials, his training? Or do you get on? Do you, do you, do you ask to talk to the mechanics and if they took care of the plane? No. You're living by faith. See, the whole world, it's everywhere, right? The question is, what do you believe in and who do you believe in? That's really the question this morning. Our Lord Jesus said, talking about himself, first the Father, for God, that's the Father, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him, believes, should not perish but have everlasting life. What did he say in the water? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, as Jesus was heading to the cross, he's God. 
He came to save us, you guys, to save the whole world. So it says that he began to teach his disciples that he, the Son of Man, here's the key word, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, and that's by believing in him. It's amazing. He's truly deserving of all of our worship. I love this scripture. Jesus says, I lay down my life that I may take it again. Can we do that? No, <laughs> right? I'm laying down my life willingly that I may take it again. And he says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. That's the king who's in the room right now. That's the king who is coming again soon. That's the king who asks you individually, do you believe in him, that you might be saved? He said that he must suffer many things because he paid our penalty on the cross for our sins and shed his blood as our substitute. And that is the only way to be saved. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to heaven to the Father but through me. We need to believe in Jesus Christ and trust what he did completely. Not in our own goodness, not at all. You know, it was Judas, one of the disciples, that betrayed him, right? And as he comes with the mob to arrest the Lord, it's amazing. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? Now, as he's on the cross and he has suffered for hours the torture of crucifixion, at the end it says, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, can you and I do that? We can't say, you know what? I'm going to dismiss my spirit right now. I'm going to commit my spirit. We can't do that. This is God dying on the cross for us. John's gospel says, as he was dying, Jesus said, it is finished. And that means paid in full, the debt for our sin. And bowing his head, this is amazing, he gave up his spirit. Well, I'm going to try right now to give up my spirit, right? I can't. You know, there's two things in you and I that we don't control. I'm going to lift my hand. Uh, I'm going to move it over here. We can move every muscle in our body. But if you want to have your heart stop right now, you can't make it stop. And if you want to stop breathing right now, you can hold your breath and you'll turn blue and pass out. But then you'll start breathing again because those two life belongs to God. But this is God on the cross. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Only God can do that. Before he raised Lazarus from the dead, Martha went out to meet him, and Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. And, and you know the story. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And she said, I know he will rise again at the last day. She doesn't know yet that Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus says to her, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, there we have it again, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he said, do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So stop, question. Do you believe this? Do you? And those of you on the third floor and in the overflow on the first floor, do you believe that he is God? Now, I know you've all noticed our world today needs hope like never before, I believe, in the history of the world. A lot of difficult, dark times in the history of the world, but I believe our world needs hope today like never before. Our, our Lord, our world needs hope. Our Lord Need, our, our world needs our risen Lord Jesus Christ. I just happened to look last night, and I was amazed. Worldwide, right now, every year, over 700,000 people 
in all the nations of the world take their own life in hopelessness and despair. Does the world need Jesus Christ? Yes. Amen. In the last minute that I've been talking to you, in the last 60 seconds, 100 people in this world have gone into eternity. Every hour, 6,000 people go into eternity. And in, in one day, every day in 24 hours, approximately 150,000 people go into eternity. Now, Paul, writing to Timothy, a young pastor, said, Paul, very beginning of the letter, 1 Timothy, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. What is your hope in? Who is your hope in? Right here it says our hope is in a person, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is in a risen Savior. We have a living hope. It's in a person. We have full hope, living hope, because he rose from the dead and he's God if we believe in him. Have you? Okay, you're there with me in Acts 16, 22. After Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead and his church was born, and here we are 2,000 years later as his church, Paul the Apostle and Silas were traveling, preaching the gospel, and they were in Philippi. And it says in verse 22, Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding, notice, the jailer. He's the key guy in this story, to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. He wants to make sure they're not going to get away. But at midnight, Paul and Silas, after being beaten bad, right, were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Well, you guys, so was the jailer before he fell asleep. Verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. That's a miracle from God. Foundations were shaken, but so was the heart of the jailer. Verse 27, and the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, look at this, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. That's the state of many people around us right now today. Do you remember John Harper running through the Titanic yelling women and children into the lifeboats and the unsaved and then preaching the gospel? Look at verse 28. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Then he, that's the jailer, called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he, the jailer, brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. John Harper, in the water, shared with his last convert twice. Where did he get it? Straight out of scripture, right here. What did he tell him that night the Titanic sank? Believe, right, on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's right from this passage of scripture. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he, the jailer, took them, Paul and Silas, the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having what? Believed in God with all his household. We're going to have a baptism June 2nd and a church picnic at Rowdy Creek Park. If you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and you've never been baptized, God commands us and calls us to be baptized. But even though he's in water over his head, basically, the night the Titanic sank, he can't get baptized, right? So does baptism save us? No. What did John Harper tell him? Believe. That's all. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and thou shalt be saved. So when we have a baptism in June, it's just an outward, beautiful symbol of what God wants to do in our hearts this morning, and that is that we would believe in him. But baptism has nothing to do with saving us. It's simply believing, right? So today we remember and celebrate what we should remember every day and celebrate that our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You know, he said that he would. We read that, and he did. And he always does exactly as he says. Now, Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary says hope. The definition says the primary sense is to extend or to reach forward. In other words, something in the future. If you and I are hoping for something that hasn't happened yet, we're hoping, right? It's to reach forward and extend. Think of that, though. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward. He's our hope. So two definitions here. First, a desire of some good. We don't hope for bad, do we? That makes sense. We always hope for something good, at least in our own estimation. So here is one simple definition. A desire of some good accompanied with at least a slight expectation of obtaining it or a belief that is a it is obtainable, and you guys, the whole world lives with this hope every day. It might happen, it might not. That's that kind of hope. I hope it does, I think it would be good, and I have a little bit of expectation, but I'm not sure, right? But I'm really hoping, you know, number two, and here's biblical hope. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. Confidence in a future event, the highest degree of well-founded that's the word of God, expectation of good, as a hope founded on God's gracious promises, a scriptural sense. Bible hope, when we read the word hope in the Bible, is God promised something and we know and believe it's going to happen. And we're putting our full weight in that the way you drove over the bridge and I did this morning or this week. There was two guys, if you can imagine this, and Luke shares this with us. The morning Jesus rose from the dead and the word started to go out. The women went to the tomb. First he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Then the other women, um, there was an angel there and told him that he was risen. And as they left, Jesus met them and they fell down at his feet. And then we know later in the day, we don't know when, he appeared to Peter privately, right? But then what did he do all day of his resurrection? Same thing he's doing all day today. He wants to be with us, with his people, with believers, loving them, personal loving relationship. So from the time he rose all day long, and then that night, he appeared in the upper room. But two of those guys took off that morning. They he had died on the cross, and then that morning they had heard stories that he'd risen from the dead, but they, for some reason, decided to leave and head the opposite direction from Jerusalem where everything was happening and where he had risen from the dead, and now they're heading for Emmaus, which is seven miles away. And so they're headed there. Now, amazing. It says that same day. That's the day he rose from the dead. And it says, so it was while they conversed in reason, they're talking together, right? That Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. He did a miracle on their eyes because he didn't want them to know it was him yet. So now Jesus, can you imagine the day he rises from the dead, wants to be, he's with people all day long. He's with those he loves. And you guys, it's the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the Lord says, what are you guys talking about, basically? What kind of conversation is this that you're walking and you're so sad? And they, and they start talking about, well, there is this, where have you been? Haven't you been here? Everyone knows. And they start talking about Jesus, this teacher. Now we're talking about hope today and what our world needs. They said this to Jesus, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. You know what they were hoping? He would take the throne of the country, get rid of the Romans, and that's what they were hoping for. And it didn't happen, so now they're disappointed. That's what they were hoping for. And, then he's, and some of the women came back and said he's risen from the dead. 
But you guys, they're going the opposite way. You know what the Lord's going to do? Same thing he wants to do with you and I, is turn us around and get us to go back. Completely turn us around. That's what repent means, you turn, right? And do um, you know what he said to them? Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then he opens the word of God and he shares the whole seven miles, everything about him from Genesis to Malachi, right? Would that be amazing or whatever? So they invite him in for supper when they get where they're going. And as they sit at the table, he takes the bread and blesses it and breaks it. And then he opened their eyes and they could see that it was him. And he vanished from their sight. It says, then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us with hope, right? Yes. While he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 in the upper room hiding with the doors locked, right? Actually 10 because Thomas wasn't there. And we know that. And so I don't think they walked back. I think they ran back seven miles. I think they skipped and they ran. And all the calves are being born to the cows now. And just notice as you go by, they skip out in the fields. Who created that? And they love to run and skip together and play. I love watching it. It's God's picture of joy. Who created that? The one who's, the, the one who's most filled with joy in this room this morning is the risen Lord who walks among us. His joy. He's overflowing with joy that we are here with him, and he's drawing our hearts to himself. So then he appeared in that upper room to the disciples. Now, I'm going to ask you to turn one more place with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. If you'll turn there with me, please. Do you believe? Do you believe he died and rose again? 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Paul says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, Christians who have already physically died. That's who he's talking about. Lest you sorrow notice as others who have no hope. And you know what? This jumped out at me. I never saw it so strongly before. Have you? Look at verse 14. Here we are today, Easter Sunday. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Do you, church? Yes. He's risen, right? He's risen indeed. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those in heaven, those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Again, verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. What did John Harper say in the water that night? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What did Paul and Silas say to the Philippian jailer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It says in the book of Hebrews, it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Second Corinthians says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I was so blessed. Good Friday, I went home, and uh, the first two mates, right, male and female, barn swallows, came back. And we have wooden houses up in our yard for them to come, and they come back every year. Who made it that way? You know, it's amazing. They'll leave, migrate, fly south for the winter, right? 
but then they come back in the spring every year. And I write down on my calendar every year when they come, and I track it, and I carry it over because I like to see, right? Well, God says in his word in, in the book of Jeremiah, even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and listen, and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. He always does what he says, always. And you guys, there's going to be a judgment. We will all stand there. And in order to be saved, we must what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be saved. And so um, I thought that was just special. Good Friday. And here they are, right? March 29th. And that's what made me think of this scripture, that the swallow comes back and they know their time of their coming but people don't know the time of the judgment of the Lord. Now, tracking that through the year, I don't know the day or hour when the barn swallows are going to come back. Um, and we don't know the day or the hour the Lord's coming back. He told us that. But I do know the season of their return. I don't look for them during the winter. I knew they were coming back soon. I know it's close. Any day now, I'm looking for them every day. It's guaranteed that they're going to come back. God made it that way, right? Amazing. You can count on it, bank on it, rely on it, trust completely that it's definitely going to happen. Believe with Bible belief that they are going to come back every year, and they do. So you know what I never say? I hope the barn swallows come back this year. I never say that. I hope Jesus comes back. No, right? Um, I'm hoping for those barn swallows to return in the biblical sense and meaning of the word hope, which means I believe they're coming back every year. I have hope they're coming back, and I clean their birdhouses every year, getting ready for them to come back. All of that to say, let me wrap it up with this, one year they came pretty early, like bookends, right? Extremes. They came at March 3rd. Another year, it was later than normal, April 11th. So think of those two parameters. But you guys, I just looked at it. And in between those two parameters, those bookends, I put the dates together. And they didn't happen in consecutive order. They, they were like this. But then when you put them in order, do you know that they've come back now on March 27th, March 28th, March 29th, which was this um, March 29th, and then this past Good Friday, which was March 30th, They've come back on March 31st, which is today's date, and they've come back on April 1st, which is tomorrow's date. That's six days in a row, right? Can we believe they're coming back? Jesus said, I'm going to descend from heaven into the clouds, and I'm going to catch my church up. And no man knows the day or the hour. But can you look at the world with me right now and know that it is surely the season that he's about to come back with the hopelessness in the world I can tell when the birds are going to come back. Here's the question. What are you waiting for and what are you hoping for? All day long on the day he rose from the dead, he wanted to spend it with people, with those who believed in him. Now, he said to the disciples the night he was arrested, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you. He died for them and for us. Now he's risen from the dead for them and for us. Question, how fervent do you think his desire is now to reveal himself to them and be with them again on the day that he rose from the dead? Can you imagine? He came and he died and he rose again. How powerful and fervent does he want them to see him and him to share his life with them? And he's the same Lord with us this morning, with you and I. Peter wrote about Jesus, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Now, here's a question. The day he rose from, the, rose from the dead, the day he died on the cross, he was in the middle. Two criminals on either side being crucified with him, right? And they were giving him a hard time and mocking him like everyone else who was there. 
And then something happened, though, because the Lord is drawing all peoples to himself. He said, when I'm lifted up on the cross, I will draw all peoples to myself. And there on the cross, between two thieves, he's drawing both of them. One of them turned and believed. The other one did not. It says, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him. He's still railing on the Lord, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? We, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. What did he say in the water? What did Paul and Silas say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou wilt be saved. He's hanging on the cross. He turns to the Lord, and he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He believed in the Lord. And his way of expressing that was saying, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was saying, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe in you. So, how about you? Thief on the cross. You know what? You're here. You're in the overflow on the first floor, or you're on the third floor overflow. And right now, you might be saying, you know what? That's what I'll do. Someday, someday, just like him, the thief on the cross, I'll believe at the last moment. But you guys, you and I are not guaranteed tomorrow. Not one of the 2,240 crew and passengers of the Titanic even had a thought that they were in, in any danger as they set sail from Southampton, England, on this supposedly unsinkable ship, the Titanic, and they had no idea that 1,522 of them were about to die and pass into eternity. So you say to me, though, that's not fair. God gave the Philippian jailer an opportunity to be saved right when he was about to take his own life with his sword. We read that. And Jesus gave the thief on the cross, just talked about that, an opportunity to be saved just before he died. And the man clinging to the wreckage of the Titanic was also given the opportunity before he died. And so you say today, I believe God will give me that same opportunity. He is right now. He is right now. He might come back today like those barn swallows. You need to be saved. Today is your opportunity. Today is the day of salvation. There's a lie that many people believe today, and it's that everybody will go to heaven. That's a lie. It's not true. The truth is nobody will go to heaven without believing in Jesus Christ and putting their trust, not in their own goodness, but the way you drove over that bridge by faith and the way you'll fly in an airplane by faith, you let go of thinking you're ever going to be good enough to make it because you can't. No one can. So he came to take our place in his love, and he was our substitute, and he died on the cross for our sins, and he holds out a free gift, and he says, if you will believe, that is how you receive. Do you know... Um, Jesus told the leaders before he died on the cross, because he kept drawing them to himself, he said, therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. Now listen, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. But it says, but as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So the way we receive that free gift is by believing. Do you know the man in the water, in one moment, he believed. The thief on the cross, in one moment, he believed. The Philippian jailer, ready to kill himself, in one moment, he believed. And he was saved. How about you today? 
have you believed? The world is dark, desperate, hurting. I'm wondering, as we were singing, and I'm closing right now, and we were singing, I was thinking of how hopeless the world is, and I don't know, but I just wonder if you're here today, or on the third floor, or in the overflow on the first floor, and you are at that place where you feel like you have little or no hope left, and Jesus wants to be your hope. He rose from the dead. He's here. And Paul said in Romans, and here is a great prayer for today. Now may the God of hope fill you, the God of hope, who's our hope? Jesus. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, listen, in believing. That's where, how it happens. That you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Personally, when I was 19 years old, that's what God did for me. And I can tell you that I would not be here today had he not, because I would have taken my own life. A Christian is someone who claims this, that at the moment of their believing, they came into a personal, eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, in his post-resurrection, after resurrection fullness because Jesus is alive and he's the very God who made the universe. And that has been my experience since I was 19 years old. And he loves you, every person hearing within the sound of my voice, and he takes it right to the heart of the matter, right to your heart, and it's as simple as believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. David's going to come up with uh, the worship team in a moment, and they're going to close us in worship. And I'm going to give you an opportunity during that time of worship to receive the Lord. Are you going to ask us to stand up and come forward? Are you going to ask us to raise our hand or just stand up in our seats? No, not at all. That man was alone in the water the night the Titanic sank. It was just him and the Lord, and he believed those two men were sitting at a table going the wrong way, and all of a sudden, the Lord's in front of them, and he said, slow to believe, you're slow to believe, and we had hoped, and they see him risen, and he opens their eyes. In a moment, they believed, and they ran probably all the way back to tell the news. The Philippian jailer, in a moment, he was ready to take his life. In a moment, he believed, and he was saved. Don't leave today. This is your opportunity today. That same risen Lord is calling all of us to make sure, have you believed in Jesus Christ? Well, Titanic story. Listen, the waves bore him away, John Harper, but strange to say, brought him back a little later and he said, are you saved now? That's the second time he asked him, are you saved? And then he came back and he said, are you saved now? Right? No, I said, I cannot honestly say that I am. He said again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And there alone in the night and with two miles of water under me, I believed. So my question to you right now is are you saved now? after the time we've spent together. And if you, in your heart, sitting there, have believed in Jesus as he's been seeking to change your heart and to believe in him, and if you have done that in a moment, and you could have done that while I was speaking, then he saved you and he entered in. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Are you saved now? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So as we close in worship, right? We're not told what he said in the water. He just believed. He just said, I, be I believed right there. The thief on the cross said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You, in your heart, sitting where you are, privately, no one will know but you and the Lord because the king is in the room. 
and his joy is overflowing, and you tell him in your own words, I want you. I want my sins forgiven. Lord, come into my heart. I want to be saved. I believe in you. I believe on you. And then all I'm asking you to do is when we're all done and the service is over, those of you on the third floor, those of you in overflow on the first floor, and those of you in here, if you give your heart to the Lord, and you've already done it, and you've believed in him, or you do it now during worship, and you decide, Lord, I'm going to place my faith in you, then just come up here afterwards. If we have a Bible to give you and a follow-up book, and we want to pray with you and encourage you in the Lord. So we'll be up here, men and women. So afterwards, when everybody's fellowshipping, getting donuts, whatever, first, come up here. And let's spend some time together and pray. So Lord, risen Lord Jesus, again, Lord, we bow our hearts to you. And right now, we enter again into worshiping you. And we pray for anyone, Lord, all of us, anyone who has not believed in you yet, and maybe even has believed that you'll think they're good enough to go to heaven, have them let go of that, Lord, and realize you wouldn't have come and died on the cross if that was possible. But you were their substitute, all of our substitute, and you hold out a free gift. You want us to follow you the rest of our life, Lord, but you want to save us in a moment right now. So, Lord, we pray that takes place as you walk Upstairs, Lord, in the congregation up there, in the overflow and in here, Lord, hearts would turn to you in salvation. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's worship the Lord.